So our next speaker is Jake Stein. Jake is a surfer, climber, gardener, photographer, and filmmaker. He is most excited about stories that lie at the intersection of science, society, and the broader environment, focusing on the human element of conservation and fisheries management. He will be working after this program with the NGO Positively Groundfish to tell the story of how local seafood, particularly groundfish, can act as a connector to place for those who live on the West Coast. And the title of his presentation today is Navigating Murky Waters, a shot at success for conservation in the upper Gulf of California. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Arturo. This is the Gulf of California, also called the Sea of Cortez. It is a place of biological abundance deserving of Jacques Cousteau's description when he called it the aquarium of the world. It is also Mexico's most productive region for fisheries resources. Therefore, it is a classroom for both conservation and fisheries management, and a case study of the diverging interests and goals of the conservation and fishing sectors. For my project, I wrote a documentary film script to apply for multiple grants by the end of this year. What you will hear today are my observations based on my research and conversations with my advisors and correspondents and how I envision this narrative being put into film. I approach this topic as a filmmaker, hoping to focus on a small part of a complex issue. There are no clear answers to the questions that exist here. Many of you may have heard of the upper Gulf of California as it pertains to the vaquita, the world's smallest and most endangered cetacean. Vaquita had become a poster child for endangered species conservation, and her casualty is bycatch to an illegal fishery for an endangered species of fish called the totoaba, which is poached for its swim bladder and is sold on the black market in China for prices of up to $50,000 per piece. The totoaba and vaquita are of comparable size, so the nets used to catch totoaba inadvertently entangle and drown vaquita there are thought to be as few as nine individual vaquita left. With the film I am proposing, I will build on these two notable documentaries that attempt to cover the conflict in the upper Gulf. As I learn more about the issue over the course of this year, I uncovered a perspective or a facet of this narrative that was not quite explored in full by these two documentaries. The problem itself is well documented, and the us versus them narrative makes for a sensational story but I find it divisive, and ways towards finding lasting solutions have been underrepresented. These films include fishermen who now face adversity for their participation in conservation efforts, like net removal, which is crucial if the vaquita is to be saved. However, conservation efforts continue to struggle to achieve their goals in the region. So the main question I asked when preparing this film was how can a shift in narrative change the way we think about and approach this issue so that conservation stands a better shot at success? The film I am making will not be about Vaquita, and it will not focus on the Totoaba cartel, as it has been called. It will center instead around the goals and interests of the communities within which any effort to save endangered species must function. In El Golfo de Santa Clara, one of the three main fishing communities in the upper Gulf, up to 90% of the population has historically worked a fisheries-related job. The existing narrative focuses on opportunities for fishermen to participate in conservation efforts, which is great for those who are able to. But what about fishermen who are unable to find even short-term employment in the realm of conservation? Those fishermen for whom government and compensation for giving up their fishing rights has run out. These fishermen and the communities themselves depend on sustained fisheries for their livelihood in the long term. It is the interest of these fishermen and the input from them that I have focused on specifically. To understand the context of the upper Gulf, let's go back and think about the history of the region and how with regards to dependence on fishing, not much has changed for over 100 years. The communities of Santa Clara and San Felipe in the upper Gulf were founded on the commercial fishery for Totoaba in the early 1900s. Once small fishing camps, now hubs of fishing activity, these towns were built to fish Totoaba. You may have heard of Totoaba only as an accessory to the plight of vaquita, and this is how I first was introduced to the fish. But Totoaba were a resource that represented a way of life, 
a connection to place. Many fishermen and wives of fishermen still speak nostalgically of fishing for Totoaba, of how the fish tastes, of how they used to cook it with their mothers and their grandmothers. The commercial fishery for Totoaba was established in response to demand for its characteristically large swim bladder, a gas-filled organ used by fish to control buoyancy. Since 1910, demand for Totoaba swim bladder from China has been the main driver behind the fishery. This photo is of the fishing camp of San Felipe in April of 1926. Those aren't prayer flags fluttering in the breeze. Those are Totoaba swim bladders drying in the sun to be shipped to Los Angeles or San Francisco and later by boat to China. The large swim bladder of the Totoaba is almost identical in size and shape to a species fished almost to extinction in the South China Sea for its supposed medicinal uh, properties. In the mid-1920s, a new demand for the meat of Totoaba came from the southwestern United States. This demand, coupled with the steady demand from China for the swim bladder, resulted in increased fishing effort. The advent of nylon fishing nets in the 1940s marked a new age for fishing Totoaba, where it was possible to catch the fish in much greater numbers. The fishery then collapsed in 1975, at which point the fishery was permanently closed, and Totoaba was listed as threatened by the IUCN in 1976. The communities of the Upper Gulf built to fish Totoaba had lost a key part of their way of life. Conservation in the Upper Gulf was initially directed at recovering the stock of Totoaba and was an example of collaboration between the fishing and conservation interests, uh, conservation sectors, excuse me, around shared interests. But in the 1970s, there was a switch in the narrative for conservation, at which point efforts began to build, efforts began to prevent the bycatch of vaquita in both illegal Totoaba nets and legal nets meant to catch shrimp and other species, became the main priority of international conservation efforts. In the interest of preventing entanglement and the resulting drowning of vaquita, conservation efforts focused on the removal of inactive or ghost nets, as well as active illegal nets used to catch totoaba. However, gill nets are not just used to target totoaba. They are also the most commonly used fishing gear by most of the legal fisheries of the upper gulf. Any gill net, when set within the range of vaquita, poses the threat of entanglement. Therefore, conservation interests have focused on establishing gillnet-free zones where vaquita, on paper and in theory, are able to swim free. They have also focused on the use of alternative fishing gear that will not harm vaquita. But these conservation efforts surrounding vaquita have failed to have a lasting effect, meaning the population has continued to decrease. Why? Because the economic lure of illegally fishing for Totoaba remains and is complicated by the difficulty of enforcement in such a remote region. Also, legal fishermen who do not have alternatives to gillnets, nor do they have alternative livelihoods to fishing, so many continue to use gillnets anyway within the range of the vaquita. However, based on previous efforts between scientists and fishermen, as I have been made aware of through the course of this project, I would say there is potential for everyone to get a piece of the pie as long as everyone is sitting at the same table talking openly. It is not unheard of for fishermen and conservation groups to work together on common ground, because who better to help design conservation strategies than those on the water where these policies have a direct impact. Communication between fishermen and scientists has progressed significantly, and there are many efforts to establish not only vaquita safe and totoaba safe fisheries, but also to increase the overall presence of fisheries management in the region. The fishermen you see here were and are closely involved with collaborative efforts to promote sustainable corvina fishery in the upper gulf, and it is these stories of success that might translate to a broader adoption of sustainable practices in the region, including these glimpses of hope in the narrative of the upper gulf can help move us away from a narrative that stagnates in doom and gloom of extinction and organized crime. An important point here is that the conversation must be framed within the context of the interests of people like this, like these fishermen. So to help remind myself of this context as I wrote the script for this film, I created this diagram to help to, to provide a useful tool for myself to wrap my head around this issue. I laid out the interests of fishermen as I understand them, based on the literature review, interviews, and personal conversations. 
revolving around tradition, sustained livelihoods from fisheries, and importantly, an intimate connection to Totoaba as a species that represents a way of life and is symbolic of the region. I did the same for conservation interests, as they have tended towards focusing their efforts on vaquita conservation in the form of gill net removal and developing livelihoods other than fishing. I also looked at how policy from Mexico and the US has been constructed to cater to both the interests of fishing communities and conservation groups. The purpose of laying out all these interests is to focus on where these interests overlap. These are the shared interests that are worth focusing on for the sake of progressing the narrative here. I also paid attention to the interests that have been underrepresented by past efforts to communicate this conflict through film, which tend to fall on the fisheries side of things. I used this diagram to round out the existing narrative, making sure that the interests from one group are balanced by input from another. It is just a Venn diagram, but it's also a conservation and fisheries management roadmap that I wish I had been able to look at when I first approached this topic. Essentially, this diagram is a depiction of the bigger picture from which to discuss trade-offs between stakeholders. My goal with this film is to help people understand why there is no clear solution in the upper gulf and hopefully to provide a glimpse of a way forward by shifting the existing narrative to show more of the bigger picture. The only way to get to the bottom of something this complex is to ask the hard questions, to explore new ways of thinking and encourage dialogue with shared goals and interests in mind. For all of this to work, context is everything, and the social well-being of local communities must be a top priority in building the foundations for conservation. I'd like to finish by acknowledging all the amazing work done in this region by real experts on this topic, and those are people here at Scripps, and up at NOAA Southwest, Fish Southwest Fisheries Science Center, at Wabese and Ensenada, and many more. And the people that helped me the most with this, thank you. Uh, Catalina Lopez, Sarah Mesnick, Miguel Castellanos, Octavio Aburto, Dick Norris, Samantha Murray, and too many more to name. Um, sorry for my endless stream of emails, but those will constantly continue, I'm sure, as this project comes to fruition. Uh, so thank you, appreciate it. Great, thank you, Jake. So a few questions coming in. Um, can you tell us what exactly goes into preparing a proposal for a documentary film script? Yeah, so when I first was told that I had to write a script for a documentary by professional filmmakers, I was wondering how that works when you're interviewing people and kind of working on the fly, but really you end up having to plan out very specifically what you want these people to say, these interviewees. Otherwise, your story doesn't have structure. So you use thematic ties to kind of construct what you would like your interviewees to say as their main points, and you build um, a treatment, which is not direct quotes, but descriptions of scenes as they build towards your ultimate uh, storyline and plot. And also, it depends which grant you're applying for, but you need to prepare, or prepare a budget, um, like a, a detailed background, which is what, I'm, what I prepared for in this project, essentially, and especially for National Geographic, which are a few of the grants I'm proposing or uh, applying for. They require a detailed background um, research, which is useful for the sake of being stuck in San Diego for 10 weeks instead of going there to actually make it. Great, and, and what do you think the future holds for both the Vaquita and the Totowaba in the Gulf? I would love for the Vaquita to not go extinct. That would be nice. I think as far as rallying local communities to get on board with conservation efforts, Totowaba represents more of a direct link and a language that's more easily understandable by local communities. That's based on my detached understanding of this I, through, through my contacts. Um, but Totoab representing a bridge between these two interests is what I see the future as, and that's why I'm focusing mostly on Totoaba and the communities themselves with this film. <laughs>